uh, after the initial talk. So we are, we're now being recorded. Okay, so if you would mute yourselves. Uh, and good morning to uh, each and every one of you on this wonderful uh, morning that we have. I, uh, you know, people sometimes say, uh, I give out a topic and they'll say, oh, I'm not interested in that. Well, that's what I said I was going to do when I put out the flyer probably a month ago. But, you know, this uh, Benedict and spirituality, it's dynamic. Uh, so you're growing, you're, you're hopefully, I mean, what else am I doing here? Uh, so by the time I teach, I got some other things to talk about and I'll try to put them in. So uh, you never quite know. For instance, I, we're gonna talk about uh, the Quakers, right? But on the way, I got two books to recommend. One we're gonna have in the bookstore soon. It's called Benedict and Options by Patrick Henry. Now, um, it's got an S on the end of it, Benedict and Options. You will may recall a fellow named Dreyer put out a book that was uh, quite popular in the conservative Christian world called Benedict and Option, only one. And basically he said, turn your back on the world and uh, let's get back to uh, uh, void culture. Let's get back to the sources or so. But uh, Benedict and uh, options, I think can be very helpful to uh, the lay people in the world uh, for one reason is because it was a lay movement. It was started by lay people. Uh, Benedict, when he put out a simple rule, I mean, the rule is pretty small. I mean, that's, that's, that's the rule. I mean, and that's in a small book. It's, he said it's for beginners and it's really for lay people. And uh, he begrudgingly put out a few things for priests, but it wasn't about hierarchical structures. It was about how people can learn to live in this world that is somewhat coming undone, but we don't turn our backs on it, but we try to learn to live in a way that will uh, inspire the world around us. They didn't isolate themselves, so to speak. And uh, I think that's very valuable. Uh, and I tell you another thing that's very valuable about it is, uh, and I think this is gonna connect very well with the Quakers. Think of a trellis. What the heck is a trellis? Well, when I, when you uh, plant, uh, root a plant in the ground, such as, uh, uh, you know, we had when we've, not you know, I'm gonna to try to explain it. When I was uh, a teenager in White Plains, New York, we bought, my parents bought a house. Uh, and, you know, like many Irish in the fifties, we were moving out of the city and the tenement apartment buildings. Uh, lace curtain. And uh, so in our backyard, there was this uh, wooden fence uh, that the, each plank went this way and it had holes in, not holes, slits in between it. And uh, in the ground, there were uh, rose bushes planted. And the roses grew up in and around and up against the, uh, this planked fence. So each bush had to have some space, even though they would intertwine somewhat as well. They were not all the same uh, um, branches of uh, roses, but they were all quite beautiful on their own branch. So you can think of the uh, Benedictine spirituality as uh, it's communal. That is the trellis is the rule, but the rule is not a law. We're so much in the United States of America functional by law and order, follow the law. And we have a Catholic church that is very much like that, unfortunately. Uh, but the Benedictine spirituality was not about that. It had a rule like a trellis. 
if you could see it that way. And uh, I think that uh, Patrick Henry brings this up at Benedictine Options. Uh, so the, the trellis is the rule. We're all connected to the rule, but we're each separate uh, branches, if you will, or vines rooted in Christ. And the rule is supposed to help us keep rooted in Christ, but we're not all the same. Each of us is trying to develop our own unique uh, spirituality on the trellis of the rule. So uh, it's communal that holds us together, but we allow each one of us to be ourselves. We're each supposed to become who God made us to be. We're not each supposed to become like each other. Uh, and that's where a lot of people get messed up. They think, oh, uh, we're all going to be the same. And then they look and they say, no, this guy's this way, this guy's this way. And so what we practice really is toleration. We tolerate differences. And then as we grow, we learn to celebrate them. Uh, and there is a, a novel I'm finished showing you, which we do not sell novels in the bookstore as far as I know. Uh, but this novel was written some many years ago by a woman named Rumor Godden, uh, who wrote, uh, I'll think of what else she wrote. I'll think of it in a second. Uh, Black Narcissus which is much more famous. This is called In This House of Breed. It's a wonderful novel, very thick, but well worth reading uh, about the Benedictine tradition. As the novel opens, it's the 1950s and uh, of which people my age remember and how it was for these Benedictine women. It's a breed in England and uh, it's a monastery. They've got something like 96 nuns. I mean, you know, just like the old days. And uh, then it moves along into some sort of more modern world. It's just up to uh, where they've just elected John uh, the 23rd as Pope. And some of them think, oh, he's just an old fat guy. We want to change. Well, they don't know what's coming. Uh, how is this going to affect them? But in here, you see differences and yet a connection. Uh, and so I think, how, how does this affect you? Well, think of relationships. Tomorrow's Gospel, for instance, in uh, my uh, Catholic circles, is going to be about uh, divorce. And who can divorce and who can't. And then it ends up with be, uh, you have to welcome children and so on. And so that children are precious. And I think of it in terms of any relationship that you're in, uh, any group that you're with, uh, you can think of uh, seekers of silence or partnerships or marriages or whatever. The important thing is at least looking at it from this tradition of the Benedictines, which was a late tradition, is you are bonded. Your trellis is your commitment to one another in Christ if you're in, in uh, the Christian tradition. But you have to let each other grow. You can't, you're not meant to be alike. You're meant to be yourself on the trellis of your relationship. And, it, and, and so the relationship holds you together and yet you have, the, you have freedom. And uh, this makes a great deal of sense to me from the Benedictine tradition. And a lot of people think, well, that's just for monks, you know, and so on and so forth. It's just not for me. Well, read the darn rule uh, slowly and meditate on it for a few years. And uh, it says you have to listen to children. You have to listen to the young. So everybody, uh, everybody has a voice in this uh, monastic tradition. There's no real hierarchy. Uh, and think about that in the, my church's Catholic tradition, which is very hierarchical and very clerical and very much into control. And the rule says, uh, when we're trying to discern something, sometimes the youngest member, which is the newest member, that's how they go. You're young according to when you come in, but often back then you came in as a younger person. The youngest member may have a wisdom that we need to listen to. So this is the value of children, uh, not to just, blow them off as uh, inexperienced, 
because the Holy Spirit works in each one of us. So as we move that into uh, the Quakers, they're anything but hierarchical. I mean, when I think about it, think what Jesus said at the Last Supper. First of all, it was the supper. It wasn't a sacrificial mass. Uh, and he said, he said to his, he wasn't ordained. Uh, as far as we know, he wasn't really a rabbi in that sense. Certainly didn't have a synagogue that he hung out in. And uh, uh, his disciples were, as we see, fishermen, uh, tax collector, zealot, uh, and they were lay people. Uh, and he said to them, this is my body, this is my blood. Uh, when you do this, remember me. It was a meal. Uh, and uh, when the Jews had their temple destroyed, their whole sacrificial way of worshiping, you know, sacrificing animals to God, to placate God, to make a deal with God, that was all destroyed. They never built another temple. But what did they do? They went into their homes and they lived Judaism in their homes. They did Passover in their homes. Uh, they did rituals and prayers in their homes. And the wife had specific things to do besides just cooking. Uh, and uh, they did it communally. They got together with friends. And what do we Catholics do? Well, if we don't go to church, we got nothing. <laughs> because we're all about hierarchical structures with, we got to have our priests because we have to have our mass because we don't have our mass. We're not real Catholics. If you ask somebody, are you a Catholic? Yes. Do you go to church? That's your first question. Why don't we just, why don't we practice our faith in our homes? Let the home be kind of a trellis in which we practice the uh, breaking bread and sharing cup and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the mass, but at all, um, it's very precious. I love it. I mean, we do it here every day, but the, the idea and the Quakers had that. The idea is you've got to live this thing, this belief, this, uh, this uh, inner spirit has to be lived in the home and in the neighborhood. You can't just go to church on Sunday and worship for an hour uh, and then go out and do whatever you want. That's not going to work. So I think the Quakers have something very definite to, to say to us. Uh, if we would just listen that, uh, and keep in mind that Jesus started out as a meal, we made it into a sacrifice and we made it into a ritual that valued the ordained clergy and made them important. Benedictine spirituality doesn't make priests important. They're second nature. They're, they're, they're not that important in the Benedictine spirituality. Uh, but they did get they did kind of make the priests a little bit important as they went along, choir monks, they call them. Uh, but Vatican II kind of reminded them to get back to your basics. So uh, as, as we look at uh, Rufus Jones in this uh, Quaker tradition, think of all these people sitting together in silence in their worship hall, their worship room, their building, uh, you can call it church, but church is really means the people of God. It doesn't mean a building. They'd be sitting together, nobody saying anything until someone felt inspired to say something. And it didn't matter what their age was. And nobody was hierarchical over somebody else. Not, not, not the way Rufus Jones saw it. And I think he held on to something that's very important, something that I would call very Benedictine. He said, connect to this inner spirit. You've got to find a way to connect to this inner spirit. And you can't connect through obligations. And you can't connect through rules and regulations. They can give you some direction and somehow hold you together. But the spirit is free to act as it will. One thing we know, it's within us. So you got to go within uh, to find it so that then you can live it in your everyday world. So. He says there is an inner spirit and we find it through Jesus Christ. Uh, and so it's important to do Lexio, to read the scriptures, to uh, meditate as, as we do, uh, centered on Jesus Christ. 
And why? Because he's, he is proposing to us in the scriptures, the kingdom, which he says is in your midst. He's proposing a way of life that he calls the kingdom. And uh, part of the kingdom is no hierarchical. The first shall be last, the last shall be first, be the servant of all, uh, uh, take, be like this child, who in those days, children were ignored, pretty much. Nowadays, it wouldn't make any sense, because children are hardly ignored in our, our world. I mean, suburban life that I see at the child is like the center of attention. Parents can't do enough for this kid, and the kid can't do enough. They go to school all day, mostly driven there, picked up, taken to various different events. God, thank God I was brought up with that busyness. Uh, how, how would they ever meditate? They got no time. They're too busy with soccer and uh, ballet and God knows what else. Not that these things are bad, but I get overwhelmed. Uh, so Jesus is proposing a kingdom in which he takes time to go off and be by himself in solitude and silence. I don't hear much of that being talked about in bringing up a child or bringing up anybody. So he's proposing <laughs> a kingdom and it's communal. Uh, the child is not isolated. The child is part of something that we are not. He, he gathered together followers because he wanted to show them how living together was important, learning to live together. And so these 12 uh, or however many he had, let's say the 12, they had to learn to tolerate one another, uh, accept one another, because they were not all going to be the same. Uh, I think Peter said towards the end of, uh, maybe it was John's gospel, he said, what about that one? You know, the one, the beloved disciple or whatever people think it is. What about that one? The John, basically. Jesus says, what business is it of yours? It's none of your business how, how he's going to develop. What is your business is to stay communally connected to him so that you can grow as a community, but not to try to dictate what's going to happen to his life or regret how his life turned out different than yours. So it's a communal situation in which Christ is, if you will, the trellis. Uh, and in Benedictine spirituality, it says Christ is our center. The rule is centered on Jesus Christ, which is why they do Lexio, why they read read and ponder scripture. So we're not all going to be the same. Uh, so if you're thinking of forming a uh, prayer community and you want everybody to be like you who's forming it, I think you're going to be unhappy and you'll probably be the first one to drop out. And maybe the others will say, thank God the leader dropped out because she or he was trying to make us all the same. So, uh, you're all supposed to be who God wants you to be. The community holds you together so you can learn to live out the best of you are with one another. How are we, this is, Rufus Jones got this. He says, how are we supposed to live out that inner light of becoming ourselves if it's not with one another? Which is why there's so much involved in social concerns because that inner spirit with which they're in touch that maybe makes them speak out in a meeting or not is supposed to be lived out together for others. Uh, I, I find so much in my tradition, private religion. People wanna to go to church to be left alone to worship, but they don't change. They don't become better people. And they certainly don't become uh, committed to uh, the, the, the world around them to make it a better place for everyone, especially the poor and the down and out and the forgotten, who in tomorrow's gospel is the child. So what we have to have, and uh, Rufus says it, toleration and loving acceptance of religious pluralism. So he's got the Benedictine charism, if you will. Uh, Benedictine's not the only one to have it, but he has it. And uh, we learn to tolerate differences and then learn to love people as they are. And that makes us better people. 
uh, what I find it, it living in the uh, monastery uh, is uh, first, I will be happy if that man will change and do what he should do. In other words, my happiness is based upon somebody else acting the way I think they ought to act. Uh, well, you don't last very long in the, in the monastery like that. And uh, then what happens is you say, okay, I accept him. He's a jerk, but uh, <laughs> I accept him and I'll just go on and live my life and he'll live his. I don't want anything to do with him. That ain't going to work either. But at least you're not trying to find your happiness through somebody else changing. I mean, think of getting married to someone. I mean, I wasn't married, but I, I probably would have thought this, that this woman is going to make me happy, a partner, whatever, is going to make me happy because they're going to act certain ways that I envisioned. That's why I'm marrying them. Well, you're marrying them. That's divorce for sure. Uh, and uh, so eventually you get to where I am going to grow by learning to love this person just as he is. And I'm here to become a better person. Uh, and living with these men, human beings, uh, is what's going to make it happen, which is why I think uh, most of us need some communal structure in our lives to uh, help us to be all that we're supposed to be. No doubt there are some called to be hermits, uh, but they're few uh, and far between, I think. Uh, so there it is. If in re you, you have to have toleration and loving acceptance of religious pluralism. Now, you take this into the world of ecumenism and interfaith relations, of which uh, Rufus Jones was part. He was like this. Uh, Howard Thurman, who we studied, he's like that. I mean, most of the people that I bring up are into not, not just tolerating, but loving acceptance. Accept them as they are in a loving fashion because they have something to teach you. Just as the child, the youngest voice in the Benedictine uh, monastery has something to say. Others have something to say. Uh, so we can learn from our uh, sisters and brothers on the spiritual path of Hinduism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, uh, Islam, and uh, Taoism, and so on and so forth. There's something to be learned if we can be open to it. Uh, instead of saying, I'm the correct religion, everybody else is wrong, they're all going to hell, I'm going to heaven. Uh, we're just fighting the Reformation over here still, hundreds of years ago, we're still fighting it. So uh, what you want is unity, not uniformity. Uh, and this, this is right out of Howard Thurman for crying out loud. We want unity, not uniformity. We don't want uniformity because that would stifle the spirit who uh, is expressed in a multifaceted way. Uh, and so um, it's not so much that we envy others' spiritual growth as we see, what can I learn from them to help me on my unique spiritual path? Uh, and so as the world is evolving, uh, if you will, as our culture can be evolving, as our spirituality as, uh, as institutional can also be evolving. And if it isn't evolving, if it isn't changing, it's dying. Uh, John Henry Newman, a saint, said that. So uh, when we begin to accept somebody or some other religious tradition as it is, that is an act of love because then I can approach them in a way that I may change to become a better person through something that they said. I can't tell you the number of times that uh, I think I know all about Jesus Christ and what he said. And then I'll read something in another tradition. I said, oh, that helps me to understand Christ better. Were they trying to help me to understand? No, but that's how the spirit works. It works through different cultures. 
uh, my Western United States of America, Irish Catholic culture that I was brought up in, in the Bronx and White Plains, uh, though I thought it was perfect, is, um, is expansive. And it's expansive by my learning from others, including the Quakers. Uh, so he says that um, there's no single ism. In other words, when you say Roman Catholicism, uh, what, what are you really saying? That it's singular, unmatched, unchangeable, complete truth. Nobody else has anything else to tell me. Well, it may have complete truth, but it's incompletely expressed. And sometimes we need to have other traditions express it to us. And there may be ways in which, this is what I think dialogue is all about, in which we can help a Buddhist to become a better Buddhist if we're a decent enough Christian. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so he's about intimate fellowship. And it should start with this presence, okay? And he, I, I believe he uses the word, the presence. You know, some people say, well, I don't like the word God. Okay, so find another word. Uh, because maybe it's loaded with a lot of past history that you can't let go of. Uh, I think as people grow, they'll let go of some of this uh, stuff that, that imprisons them, words. Anyway, call it a presence. Uh, and he does. And he says, it's an intimate fellowship with this presence, not just a knowing about. I could say, well, I know about so-and-so, or I met so-and-so, but that's not very intimate. It, <clears throat> it's an intimate fellowship, because they like that word fellowship. They think of it as communal, connect, connectivity, relational, communal with this presence. Uh, and this comes about when we're liberated from fears, anxieties, worry, hate, injustice, and bitterness. Those are words he uses. I'm not making them up. Sounds a lot like a 12-step program to me uh, in, in recovery. Uh, you just keep growing. And, and because a spiritual path if it's got an intimate connection with your innards, not just an intellectual belief in the existence of, or following certain rules of uh, church attendance or avoiding certain sins of the 10 commandments, uh, but something that's, because people can do that and they still have fears, anxieties, worries, hates, injustice, and bitterness. They're still prejudicial. But if it becomes intimate, interiorly connected, which I think is what we're trying to do with centering prayer groups and, and seekers of silence and our own meditations and me here in this monastic environment, uh, is so that those roadblocks, and he names them fears, they don't, they don't control us anymore. We become, first you become aware of them, and then you learn to let them go. What are we doing in uh, contemplative practice is letting go of a focus on uh, thoughts and uh, uh, lack of uh, emotional sobriety, if you will. Uh, we're just letting go of that stuff for, for that half hour. Oh, I have a sense of fear. And we say, well, don't pay attention to it. Basically, you don't pay attention to it. And you find out that when it doesn't get your attention, your energy, it somehow begins to dissipate. So a lot of the, the power of uh, fears, anxieties, worries, hates, injustice, and bitterness is because we give it power. Some of it may have its own power, but we give it power such that it controls us. And with a more contemplative practice, you can become aware of fears, but they don't control you. You can become aware of uh, loneliness, but it doesn't control you. I could say sometimes, oh, I'm having the feeling of loneliness. I don't have to do anything to get rid of it. I become aware of it and I don't focus on it. And it just sort of is around, but it doesn't beat me up. It doesn't make me respond in a certain way. I mean, we're human beings. We're going to feel lonely at times. 
we're going <laughs> to we're going to have a lot of emotions. They just don't control us like they used to. You know, some people think, oh, the spiritual life is all about not having any what they call negative emotions. Uh, and, uh, you know, emotions are emotions. That's part of the human condition. Um, and, uh, I mean, we have them here. You think, well, you go into a monastery and what's going to happen is you're not going to have these feelings anymore. Well, if you come to a monastery to get rid of your feelings, you're in the wrong place. And if you get married to get rid of your feelings, you're in the wrong relationship. Uh, so, and he'll tell you that. I mean, he'll, I mean, Rufus will tell you that. So you want tranquility and peace, but it doesn't come until you deal with the roadblocks. And most anybody who's done a contemplative practice will tell you that. Uh, that they had to let go of a lot of stuff uh, that they be, didn't even know they had. Uh, but in quiet stillness and solitude, you become aware because the spirit will make you aware of the roadblocks that are within you from maybe past history. Uh, a lot of mine is from past history. I mean, how do we develop? But eventually behind all that is tranquility and peace. And not just the tranquility and peace of uh, that first, uh, you know, your 20 minutes and say, oh, I had a wonderful meditation. Well, I know what you mean by that. It means you felt good. Uh, you can have a wonderful meditation and feel terrible. Uh, he said, that's not a wonderful meditation. Well, don't, it is, if your life's changing for the better. How many times have I had a meditation? I sit there centering and just my mind's going crazy and so on and so forth and all kinds of stuff. And, and I says, oh, well, that was a waste of time. And then later in the day, I have an inspirational thought or I make an action or an attitude that seems very different and much better than what it had been. Something used to bother me doesn't bother me. And I think, wow, where'd that come from? Well, it might had to do with the uh, meditation in the morning because God's working on you and you're trying to judge it by how you feel, forget that. How you feel is immaterial to God's work in you. But you don't know that for a while. What you're looking for is what Therese of Lisieux, whose feast day was yesterday, I'm sure just Lane Miller knows that, as a good Carmelite. And uh, she wrote a letter when she was 16, 16. <sighs> when I was 16, I was a wreck. And uh, she wasn't even a novice yet. I'm still kind of a postulant in the uh, uh, Carmel she's in. And uh, she speaks about false light, the same thing that John of the Cross spoke about, who we think is a great mystic. Well, <laughs> she's 16 years old and she gets it. The light appears as darkness because if, it, if we could see God's light, it would just blow us away. So God comes to us in the intimate light as darkness. So she says, and John of the Cross says this, what she says, I don't want a false light. A false light is when I feel good, but it's not good for me. Uh, so she says, I'm not looking to feel good. And in the 1890s, you wouldn't join a Carmel to feel good. In this book, where's that book that I just showed you? Uh, I can't even find it. Oh, there it is. Uh, here it is. In this house of breed. 1950s, my God, they suffered a lot worse than we do now with their kind of diet and stuff like that. Huh. I mean, you don't go into monasteries to feel good. I mean, it can be tough. We have no heat on here uh, uh, yet. And I don't know when the heat's going on. That's why I'm going to California, 70 degrees in San Francisco. No, 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 it just happens. Any case, uh, I'm not making a confession, but, it's cold in this house and uh, the chapel's not heated, the dining room's not heated, the halls, everything. I have heat in my room, but I'm not going to live in my room 24 seven. So um, I think that we have to uh, recognize that false lights, I'm feeling good in my meditation. Well, a lot of people will drop out if they only do it to feel good. What you want to do is have your life completely changed to become in my tradition, to become like Christ, the Christ you are called to be. Uh, so tranquility and peace can come, but it's a rocky road to it. Uh, but when it begins to come, you have what Rufus calls a quiet, mystical receptivity. That is, there's a certain stillness in me. 
And I experience that more regularly now. This, and if I can allow myself to be the best I can be during the day, not trying to change other people or blaming or whatever, and trying to be of service and doing med my meditation, Lexio, you know, and working in service to the community, uh, I do get a certain quiet within if, in my meditations. And it's mystical because it's mystery. I don't make God show up, but I'm receptive to that presence and not trying to make it do anything. I don't sit there and say, okay, Lord, make me holy, make me feel better. I just say, here I am. And uh, I sit there and try not to pay attention to my crazy mind. Uh, so that is, I think, will bring about a certain tranquility and peace. And this presence, and he calls it presence, is ultimate reality. Wow, Thomas Keating used the same word. I thought Keating made it up. He didn't. Uh, ultimate reality is uh, what Rufus Jones, I think Rufus died in 1950. So uh, when Keating was just a, a little shoot on the trellis, uh, ultimate reality, and Thomas Merton was a shoot too. Uh, but that's what he says, ultimate reality. That is, this is the really real, but it's not going to uh, wave a flag in your face, say, hello, here I am. You've got to be searching. And sometimes it's, uh, it's a culture that doesn't fill us, that makes us then search for an alternative. And I think that's uh, part of what the Benedictine spirituality offered way back in the day of Benedict in the 500s, when you still had the kind of Roman mm, governing system, but the culture itself was coming undone. Uh, invasions and all, and it just was losing a communal sense. And uh, he said, here's a way that will help us to live and express a way of living for others who were kind of lost. Uh, and no wonder it was so popular. Well, this is what people are searching for today. And they don't know that, uh, or that there might be something in the Benedictine tradition that could be satisfying to them, even if they don't join a monastery. So we are connective to people and to culture. We are not trying to hide out and we're Trappists, well, supposed to be strict Cistercians. Uh, so um, he feels that God needs us. Uh, and, you know, so, I've read places, you hear it in the Psalms, even some places, God doesn't need me, or God's the unmoved mover. He's not moved by me one way or the other. Well, he's not a he, by the way, he could call it a she. Uh, we'll call it the presence. The presence needs us and we need the presence like a branch and vine. What good is a vine if it has no branches in a sense? So God is in our midst and will be God expressive as we become our most truest selves since we're made in the image and likeness, but we're not all clones, all right? Uh, but each of us has a divine spark. Holy mackerel, Meister Eckhart. We each have a divine spark. And there was a whole, whole tradition said so we have no Jansenism and a lot of uh, modern uh, religious movements now that says we are just corrupt, terrible people. And unless we do this, we are gonna die in perdition. Uh, well, I don't know unless we do this, but we are not corrupt. We may have a lot of bad habits. Uh, uh, we may have addictions. But basically, when God made us, God said, it is very good. And I'm, I'm done. I've done my work. I'm resting. This is the tops. Uh, so we're very good. But we act very badly at times. And uh, here's a way to get out of acting very badly. But we don't make ourselves good. We are good. And we discover our basic goodness when, in my tradition, we get rooted in Jesus Christ. Uh, you can look at it in the Buddhist traditions. Uh, 
suffering is in the world. And why are we suffering? Because we have all these desires thinking that's going to make us happy. And how do we get rid of them? Well, you got to meditate, eightfold path, and so on and so forth. Uh, but so we're like vine and branches with God. Think of it, God needs you. So why not shape up? Uh, and I don't know how God was going to need me in the monastery. Maybe uh, talking today to uh, uh, to the people who are here, who is, uh, oh, 23, oh my gosh. And we record it and uh, the whole bunch of other people may hear it. And I may hear nothing from these people ever. That's not important. What is important that you do the best you can with what you've got. And that's all I really can do. Uh, so um, we have this divine spark. We're not depraved people. This has got to give us some hope uh, and uh, in the 18th century, think about this, 18th century. Now, he's writing in the late 19th into the mid 20th century, okay, Rufus Jones. But in the 1700s, John Locke speaks about the triumph of reason. Humankind, or mankind, as they might have said then, humankind with reason will be the best we can be, and we will not have all this nonsense. So it was the age of enlightenment that said, ah, original sin, forget about it. Then came World War I and World War II. Ah, so I, don't, I think John Locke and the age of enlightenment needed a little bit of balance, okay? Uh, what it was, what, what I think is wonderful things that came out of it was the value, the value, the, the creation, if you will, of science. Uh, well, we've had science growing little by little, but it really took off in the 1800s. And uh, the inventions that we had in the 1900s and so on. Uh, so, and science can tell us a lot about creation, God's creation. And what we bring to it is our experience from the spiritual and mystical of creation so we can work with science to make us better people as opposed to saying ah, fooey on science or science ain't fooey on religion well i'm talking about spirituality and hopefully we can touch organize religion to make it i mean religion means bridge we're supposed to bridge to god and we need to be a bridge to the world god to the world but we've we got to get uh, we got to get some depth in ourselves, some some strength, be a strong bridge. So um, you know, because there were so many things that came on the Irish hunger, this our civil war, the French terror, uh, and as I said, World War One and Two. You know, a lot of mess in this age of reason. We weren't very so we can't just make it with our heads. We need the heart. So the mystical in nature, he calls it the overworld. And I think of that book about trees. Uh, the mystical in nature is the overworld. And uh, it, even nature has a mystical dimension to it because it's part of God's creation. You know, And if you look at a tree and uh, what you, you don't see all that's going on, underground the roots of those trees are really tree talking with one another if you will reaching out in a communal fashion to help one another to be the best tree that they can be this we know from science biology uh if you will or tree biology uh so this this you 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 discover by exploring, but it gives us a sense of what God is about uh, in this, because God made the tree. So um, within each one of us is this divine nature that is connective. So as you get in touch with your truer, deeper self and become more your true self who God made you to be, you will naturally be communal. I see it here in the monastery. I see it here in myself, the way I've changed and my uh, blaming, then acceptance, then loving. 
the same person would never change. They never changed. Uh, so, you know, they still don't put things back in the refrigerator the way they should, but we got to let that stuff go. Uh, yes, we are going to end with a meditation, Marlene. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the overworld that is our interior selves is a beyond, but it's not beyond us. It's beyond that's within us, says Rufus. I love that. It's a beyond the age of reason, if you will. It's beyond mental faculties. It's beyond all that science can tell us, uh, but it's within us. That's what we mean by beyond. It's within us. It's deeply within us when we can let go of our minds trying to figure everything out. And he says it feel, this beyond feels like something that breaks in on the soul. It breaks in on our sort of interior, all those interior feelings and emotions that I talked about before. So we got a certain amount of fear, anxiety, worry, hate, injustice, and bitterness, and bah, something breaks in on us. Uh, it, it's, it just sort of knocks down all those barriers in some way. And some of us have seen that happen in, and that's what's transformed us and made us really say, I am called to be more of a contemplative because something's breaking in on me. I, at first you think you control it and then you realize you don't. But what you control is showing up. Uh, and it's it, it, this break in, this breaking in is very creative because God is creative. Uh, so it's this same source and Rufus points this out. It, this is the, this breaking in of, of um, the beyond is what drives artists, musicians, writers, architects. What makes someone a creative genius? The spirituality that is within them. And they may, some may not even go to church or they may say, they don't have any religious belief, no, no doctrinal belief, but they have a belief in what's going on inside of them and they know what's there and they express it. That's the beauty of it. Their music, their art, their writing, their architecture expresses something of the depths of, the, of humanity because it's expressing something of the beyond that is within us. And you go, wow. And you would ask that person if they, if they are a Christian, they might say, no, I'm not. I don't believe in that stuff. Uh, but they're profoundly moved by that same stuff. Uh, and, you know, if we're good bridges, we might be, and maybe the Benedictine tradition is such that an artist, a writer, a musician could come here for a retreat and experience something that touches something that they know is within them and say, oh, this is how we can be influential. So the, he says, the essential fact of religion, the essential fact of religion is love as relationship. He didn't say the essential fact of religion is going to mass on Sunday, uh, obeying the 10 commandments. Does he believe? Of course he believes in the Ten Commandments. Of course they have gatherings on Sunday. But he says that's not the essential fact of religion. It's love as relationship. Not just relationship with people who are just like you in your mind. That's why you relate to them because they don't challenge you to grow. They're just like you. And how many of us look to live in places where people are just like me? Uh, and avoid people who are not like me. Uh, so it's love as relationship. And it begins with a spiritual interrelationship, so says Rufus. I think he's right. You have to have an interrelationship with God such that coming out of you is a sense of non duality. He's speaking about non duality, which Thomas Keating names and and that's the buzzword today in the 21st century non-duality we're all one but it doesn't come out of here it comes out of the heart 
and it will come out of the heart from the contemplative practice. You can't think it up and you can't make it up. Uh, and even your private meditation, I, I don't, it's not religion. The private meditation is your private meditation. But if it develops into love as relational with people who are not supposedly like you, then it really becomes religion as Rufus Jones would see it. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I keep it in mind uh, when I, uh, I, I, that's why I like to uh, do some meditation time when I go to mass. I like to sit quietly. I just receive what I think is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I don't wanna go running out to do my programs for happiness. I want to take some time. So uh, he says the religious, uh, the religion becomes possible when our sense of God's love as interrelationship becomes real. So we believe in non duality, then we have to live it out. Why are you going to live it out? Well, find a community of people and live it out. And don't look for a community of people who are just like you. Look for a community of people, period. Uh, and uh, I think that's part of why they're, the Quakers are so successful in reaching out in social services is they go to parts of the world uh, that are not their culture. Uh, the ones who are helping are going to a part of the world that's not their culture, maybe not their color, not their language, not their ways, and they are being of service not just to be nice uh, and not to make them a democracy, uh, but because they have a genuine interior sense of love for these people. And that's what makes their uh, social services so successful. And that's when love becomes real. So there's no dualism between God and us. You could look at Julian of Norwich and see that. Uh, Thomas Keating, you know, so many others, non-duality. There's no dualism between God and us, except in our minds and in our culture that has no uh, deep mystical connectivity. Uh, so what would that have been? The colonial invasion, the European invasion of the Americas missed this point of non-duality. They saw all these little dark-skinned people as, ooh, great slaves. Let's put them in the mines. Let's rip off uh, South America and get uh, all these uh, uh, minerals, uh, diamonds and whatever, and send it all back to the uh, king so that uh, he can uh, use it to borrow weapons uh, to go kill people. That ain't gonna work. Uh, so we've been going at this thing now for quite some point. And uh, I think we need to make a stop here at 926. Oh my God, you've been sitting for a long time. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break to 936. And there's a way to support me that, uh, so that I can stay out of debtor's prison and Chris Lake will put that up, my Venmo account and the address up here at the monastery. Uh, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break, I gotta go Turn on the oven. I'm baking homemade pizza today. They don't deserve it, but I'm going to be loving anyway. Okay. We'll see you in a while.
So we we starting the meditation. Uh, I'm back now. Who's leading? Uh, wait, everybody back. It's nine. No, it's not nine thirty-six. We got another minute. <laughs> We're eleven thirty-six in your time. And uh, so we're letting everybody get back here from their uh, break. Uh, and uh, who is leading the meditation? I forgot. Ed, Ed and me. Oh, okay. Okay. I, oh, we got four chats. Let me just look quickly at these chats, see if there's anything I have to support Father Terry, monastery address, be back in 936. We're not ending with a meditation. We do a meditation, then we do a little Q&A, and then uh, I might have a few more comments. So we're all back. Uh, so go with it on the meditation, just laying it in. 20 minutes. You're gonna hit a bell or something? Our sound is our sound is not on. Sounds on now. Yeah, okay. Her?
Okay, we're all back. All right. Um, what uh, does anybody have any uh, questions at this time? You can put them in chat or you can just unmute and ask. Uh, and uh, I have a question. Sure. Does <clears throat> Rufus Jones get into um, explaining any um, strategies for when the ones that you're using don't work? In other words, um, I have a, have a certain meditation technique that works most of the time, but then it doesn't. So I have to switch it up. Um, and it's only after a little while that um, I've been dry, I guess, that I noticed that I need to change up my game, you know, so some certain meditation technique or certain philosophy or the way you're looking at something might just stop working at a certain time in your life. And um, I was just wondering if he addresses, you know, dry periods or things like that. Well, one of the things that you get from uh, the Quaker model of praying together is uh, there may be a set time that you'll sit quietly, but uh, let me tell you, it's a lot longer than 20 minutes. And anybody can speak up when they feel called by the spirit, since there is not a hierarchical structure they don't have to raise their hand and say, Father or Mother, can I uh, speak? And uh, it allows them to listen to the wisdom of one, as well as someone else then responding to that, let's say, wisdom. So that if somebody were to sit up, say, stand up and say, what you just said, uh, there's a very good chance that if not in the meeting itself, afterwards, somebody might have some particular advice that uh, they found worked for them. Two things come out of this. One is they're not going to tell you what you should do. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you what they did that worked for them, which reminds me very much of the 20th century uh, uh, recovery programs. You share your experience, strength, and hope. You don't tell other people what to do. Uh, and I think by the time you offered, I mean, the, by the time you were asking that question, you would be feeling your lack of being in sync. In other words, if you were at a gathering, I mean, I'm not a Quaker, but if you were at a gathering and that was all that you found very satisfying and inspiring, and then all of a sudden you you would still go, but your heart wasn't open, or you were cranky or you were critical or something, you know, that would um, call to your attention that, you know, what, what is it that's bugging me? Why, you know, what is it about this that's um, not giving me the same uh, joy that it used to? You know? Well, because they're interrelational in love, somebody would have a response. I mean, Thomas Keating would say, forget it, just keep meditating. It's uh, a, <laughs> you're unconscious or it's a blockage, don't worry about it, just go on. In other mm -hmm. words, he would be saying, don't change your game. It's just part of the process. Uh, it feels like a darkness, but it isn't. So what happens, I think, is you forget that or you forget the solution, let's say, uh, and you're in touch with the problem. Well, someone else remembers the solution. This is what's supposed to happen in uh, contemplative prayer groups when people gather together uh, and they sit for 20 minutes or a half hour afterwards, rather than jump into some book, uh, there ought to be a time 
when they can share their experience and not just their experience, how good it is, but exactly what you just said. Mm-hmm. And then you listen to somebody else. And often what happens is someone else will say, something, oh, I forgot that. That's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, Thomas did say that, didn't he? And so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. There's not too much under the sun. Uh, and uh, that's new. It's that we forget all we haven't heard before. So I think that's how it would work. The downside of uh, worship groups is you really don't get any time to share with one another. Uh, You're all focused on the altar and on the event up there. And when it's over, you leave. And if anything, you get together at coffee and donuts and you sit with people who are just like you. Uh, Not too much growth and all that. Uh, so I think that the uh, meditation groups have a great possibility, any meditation group that works at SALT, and that's what really the Quaker gathering is, is about, is a meditation group. It's not all they do because they have a great amount of, uh, of uh, social outreach that they do to the poor and so on and so forth. And they also spend time with uh, being with one another uh, and that's not, what I loved about the lunches, the brown bag lunches at Seekers of Silence, and that's what we don't have with the Zoom, um, was the fellowship, because we could all discuss what was um, presented, and it's not always in line with what we think. So I felt, um, I always felt stretched, you know, by um, the presentation, it gave me new thoughts, and then talking with anybody there, there were a lot of people that didn't think exactly alike, but I I do miss that because that was something that that was very helpful. And we always made that joke that we're seekers of silence, but we sure did have a good time <laughs> in conversation. We could get quite loud when we weren't quiet. Well, maybe you can do that on a, uh, a Zoom gathering. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, just talking about your, the experience of the prayer. Does anybody have anything that they might uh, be to help me? Yeah, maybe a Zoom lunch after your Zoom presentation. <laughs> yeah, so you could do that amongst one another. Yeah. And uh, what what I miss, uh, you know, when you mentioned that, I miss the tuna fish. Uh, I do too. <laughs> Michael's, Michael's not oh here God. right now. He's, uh, he's taking the powder, <laughs> but uh, he's had it with me. But I miss the tuna fish. I think about that. I says, <laughs> oh, will you come to Knoxville to teach us and be with us and then we'll share? I says, yeah, if there's tuna fish, but otherwise, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not getting on an airplane just to see you. I want that tuna fish. <laughs> but there's something interesting about the tuna fish uh, that I was thinking about. And that is, I make tuna fish, uh, but it doesn't look like Michael's tuna fish. It doesn't look like Michael's tuna fish. Keep trying. <laughs> And I have no idea what's in Michael's tuna fish, and I don't need to know. The important thing is that I experience his tuna fish and uh, uh, without knowing exactly what's in it. And isn't that the mystical dimension? He has mystical tuna fish that you experience, <laughs> prayer. You experience prayer and you don't know what it's all about, but you have an experience of it mm-hmm. and you can't duplicate it. You can't look, but it's 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 God at work, you know. Think of God as as, uh, as tuna fish, as that you can't duplicate. Uh, but the only way you're going to get it is if you show up. That's right. So I said, the only way I'm going to get Michael's tuna fish, I got to show up in uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. So uh, is it? Excuse me. Is it is it harder to accept yourself than to accept others? Uh. It, I think it, de- it depends on where you are at the moment. Uh, I think when you're egocentric, it's hard to accept others. When you have the aha moment, oh, they're not the problem, I am. Then you enter into that, suddenly you have trouble accepting you because it just took you off your pedestal. You're the only one to put you there. Yes. Uh, yes. So, but that's humility. That's, what, that's where humility comes from. Humility is when you take yourself off the pedestal. And so that's why living with others is important because at first they're the problem and you're the solution. There's no humility there. And, 
And that's the problem with a hierarchical structure and a clerical structure is we priests think we're the solution and you're the problem. And uh, we're not, we're often the problem, but we're not an institutional problem, we're personal, we're problem to ourselves. And uh, which is why I love the Benedictine tradition because it's so lay oriented. Uh, no one person tells another person what to do. They, they express themselves and we work through things. So um, that's how I find it. I think that humility has come to me because I've realized that others are not the problem I am. And that was, uh, in other words, I came here thinking that I was particularly uh, good. I mean, I am good, but I was, I was particularly holy. I was like a head at just lane. I was up on the next rung. <laughs> And then I realized, you know, I'm not even up with Ed Miller. I'm, I'm, I'm below him. You know, that's pretty long. So uh, what are you going to do? But then that's humility. Humility. And you come, you come from that. And if you can function each day from a, not humiliation, that's what other people do to you. Humility is what God gives you. And the longest section in Benedict's rule is on humility. Because if we're really going to learn to live together, we have to live out of humility not out of our egocentricities. Everybody brings egocentricities to uh, a communal setting, uh, but, and, and it's not gonna last long. You know, how long did uh, uh, all those, uh, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and all those guys trying to live out that special life? They lasted a couple of years. Henry David Thoreau only lived at Walden Pond for two years. And you know what? His mama and his sister did his laundry. And he would go into he go to Concord now and again and get a good supper from his mommy. Uh, but he didn't write about that. He wrote all the other things that attract you. So keep in mind how long these people last at some of this stuff. And uh, you know, people say, "Well, how long are you going to be in the monastery?" I says, "It's my monastery phase. It's the best answer I can give." So people will just let me be, because uh, you know, it's not. It's not so much where you live, it's how you live, where you live, that I think is the spiritual growth. And, uh, it, and I think this, uh, this almost a month out of here, depending upon the highway, it could be less than a month because I can't get out of here or I can't get back because of snow or closed highways or whatever. But um, it'll be, it's gonna be fascinating for me to see how I am in places that I used to go to, like San Francisco. And uh, I've already told my sister that uh, I used to love going to Sea Ranch because I love the smell near the ocean. But I realized I have that same smell here. It's not about the ocean. It's about the, the land and the foliage and the temperature and the weather and the dew. And uh, I said, I don't have to get away from things anymore. I live away from things. Uh, so my whole lifestyle is really affected, but where it's going to go, I really don't know, but I don't have to know. It's like contemplative practice. You don't know where it's going, but that's not important to you. Right. It's that you go with it and uh, right. you, let it, you let it take you. I think that's what's important. So as uh, Keating says, the most important thing we do is show up. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you feel off your game, keep showing up. Uh, and to keep reading and uh, keep talking to others about it because often they have the answer that you can't find. That's what community is about, I think, in part. The answer that you can't find. Thank you. Hey, right. Terry, I have an observation. I have an observation about the Quakers. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. That during the Great Famine in Ireland in uh, the 1840s, one of the few groups, religious groups that came to Ireland and fed the hungry were the Quakers. And, they, and they, they weren't trying to sell anything. They were just helping people who were in desperate need during that time. So it's, it, it fits with what you're talking about. They just did, did good things for people without trying to uh, persuade them to uh, get into any particular religious conviction. Anyway, yes. when you were talking about them doing good things, yeah. Uh, interestingly that's enough, all. That's all. It, it was yeah. not the famine, it was the hunger. 
those people had food. Mm -hmm. The rich had food and they wouldn't give it to the poor. Oh. The Brits right. and the landowners right. had it. Uh, so as I read my Irish history, they would say it's the hunger, not the famine. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's just us Irish trying to accept the Brits. You know, that's a, that's a big thing. <laughs> it's a big uh, to do that. But yes, see, a lot of, you think about the missionaries of, the, of, of uh, my, my tradition, uh, for many years, especially with the Reformation, that's really when it took off uh, because we had to prove that we're right over against these prods who were doing missionary work. And what we did is we went to cultures that we knew nothing about, except that they weren't Catholic. And we tried to make them Western Europeans, Western European Catholics. We didn't bother to learn their culture because we thought it was worthless. Now that to me, is uh, is a big mess. And uh, we've learned from that. Eventually we learned from it. I think Vatican II taught us a lot of that, but the, the Quakers had it right from the get-go uh, that they didn't try to uh, transport whatever their culture is. They tried to help people uh, who needed it. Uh, so it wasn't, we're gonna feed you and then we're gonna baptize you, uh, which is what a lot of, uh, uh, Christian missionary work was all about, especially in my culture, where sometimes we just baptized you. Uh, as you came over on slave ships, we baptized you, and then you continued on into slavery. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of complaints about slavery from uh, some Catholic missionaries, but it wasn't being listened to in Europe because it was making them too much money. And that's the downside of institutional religion. Uh, Brother Terry? Yes, ma'am. The Holy One. <laughs> yes, yes, Miss Holy. Uh -oh. Not me, but I have um, a friend in Brazil who is used to be, when Vatican II opened the, all the orders to look back at, at their origin, she belonged to a Sacred Heart of Jesus teaching order. And they, and they were founded by, uh, the, their founder helped them, help, uh, was teaching in France, the poor girls. In Brazil, they were teaching the richest girls. Their school was the best. So they gave them the option to choose something to work with the poor. She chose to live with, a, with an Indian tribe where the, um, the, uh, the, the chief had asked for two people, one to teach Portuguese because they spoke a language nobody could understand. They were a very small tribe and someone for uh, a nurse because they were being, uh, you know, Portuguese, the, the people, the Brazilians were getting close to their places where they lived in the in the jungle, and they would catch if they caught a cold, they would die because they had no immunity. So he asked for these two people, and my <clears throat> friend volunteered to teach, and she went with the nurse, and the nurse gave up after a little while, and so she was there doing both things for forty years, and she would come to the to the to the town to my where my hometown and would have the meetings once a year with with her community because some people some of the community decided to stay teaching so what this happened is a change in the way missionaries were doing their work and it started with Pierre de Foucault in in um, Algeria where he went there and he learned the language the culture and he didn't try to teach, you know, he had one, he would ad, uh, adore the, the, the presence of, of, of the host, but he didn't force anybody. He, but on the contrary, he wanted to learn the country. Came with, the, with, with also the understanding of Margaret Mead that the cultures have a lot of value and they're not like the Spanish, you know, like the European curtain. So you had to present uh, to be understanding 
of of them and and like Jesus was living with the culture and loving the culture so and respecting the culture so that's what I was going to say there has been a, a very big change and it started with the little sisters of the poor and it's spreading and even the Jesuits have changed their their idea that you described exactly dressing the Indians and baptizing them and all that so that has changed a lot all over the world. Just want to let you know because I have a special love for, for this uh, this change. Yeah, yeah, if I could add something there, the tribe that she talked about was only discovered in 1970. And they were living in the Stone Age, the rough Stone Age, not even the polished stone. They they uh, So that, that was the thing she went to and she never tried to convert them to Catholicism or baptizing them or anything else. She just accepted them like they were. And of course, nowadays, we, we visited there in, I don't remember, 2001. 2001. And uh, it's, uh, it's really remote. It's right up in the middle of the jungle. And she lived there all those years. And nowadays, they, the problem is that they are becoming uh, Brazilianized, I guess, because they are, they've learned Portuguese and they uh, are now wearing clothes and um, all of that. But it was so it was so slow and Very and slow. respectful. You know, they were the ones that asked, "Could we have some clothes on?" Because they were seeing man coming, and so there are lots of problems. But she stuck to the idea of loving them. She learned their language. She made dictionaries. You know, for and the kids who were her kids that she taught Portuguese are now teachers. They teach the little kids Portuguese, and and learning they learn how to write their language so it won't be forgotten, you know, and lost like the others. Yeah. So, I, this gives me a lot of hope because we have changed. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're coming along quite quite well now. Uh, I I think um, I hope, and uh, but that's you know you 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 put something like uh, Foucault and uh, Mother Teresa up mm -hmm. against the American fear of the immigrant and the refugee, mm -hmm. and you realize that we are one of the highest percentage of church going people in any Western culture. And yet this is our response. So uh, there's a lot to think about and the Quakers are trying to help us. So, well, you know, we have part four, which is uh, Saturday, November 6th. And uh, I, I'll be back in Colorado by then. Uh, so uh, next week, we are going in, at nine o'clock mountain time, 11 Knoxville time. I'm going to be doing another piece on cooking and contemplation. Uh, so we still got my, I think that's part three or four. I'm not even sure at this point, but there should be a flyer out uh, on that. But anyway, it's, it's whatever I'll be talking about that next Saturday. And then, um, then the 6th, and then uh, the week after that, the 13th of November will be uh, uh, freedom, contemplation and freedom. So we'll uh, see you all then and take care, okay? Miss you all, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank Father. you, Father. You're welcome. <laughs>